Some of you may have heard of the Great Reset. What's the Great Green? What is the Great Reset? Great Reset. Um. So that. Is it a version I, of the New World Order? Is that what they're changing the name to? I. I. I from. You know how I feel about political outlooks and differences in political outlooks. I don't think it's a weakness. I think it's a strength. And I think America needs to get back to being able to have a conversation with people who don't agree. We learn so much from each other when we do that. You, I think, are going to hear and learn and question and disagree or perhaps really agree. Um... Like very few podcasts will uh, push you to, you're going to learn an awful lot. I think we're still trying to move in that direction, but it's all about keeping capital, the free flow of capital going and investments happening without, without trade barriers and that. It's not me saying they want you to own nothing and be happy about it. It's I never want to go into this supermarket again. Uh, the earlier statement now reiterated that he's not a determinist seems to fly in the face of what he just said, uh, which I take as strict determinism. It's, it does not cease to be determinism if you say man makes history and then add to it, of course, people who are weak and cannot help themselves. Objectivism hasn't much to offer society today. It's basically an issue of free will versus determinism. This means that it must be a system, studied as a system, and not as an idea. Its claims uh, to be the sponsor of, uh, of, of freedom are purely contingent. Of uh, the fact that the principle of human rights has not been fully understood. It was not even fully understood in 1776, and it has not been consistently applied in legal philosophy uh, to this day. So there are a lot of uh, problems to be dealt with, but what we first need in order to deal with those problems is an understanding of what the principle of man's rights means. And what we mean ordinarily by such terms as selfishness and altruism and taking care of people and loving each other and being worried about, uh, about the others besides ourselves. On confidence in the economy at a time when we're already questioning the confidence we have in our political leaders, our media, um, I think that's, that's something that, that concerns me. It's very scary. I I'm still uh, trying to figure out what the difference between us is, that is precisely, and, and uh, I, I think I keep coming back to this um, point about metaphysics. Do the ends justify the means? In your opinion, do they? Um, I don't find it possible to say no. What will you do if you're the king of an empire and you rely on the slavery of your people to keep you rich and powerful. But you see your people waking up and starting to show dissent. What would you do if you wanted to stay in power? You would sure hope that they forget about it. You would want to distract them, or even better, turn them against each other so that they forget about their original cause. The mainstream media which we all know is in the business of maintaining the status quo, is doing a great job at doing just that. They are reducing this global transformation that's going on, this beautiful shift in human consciousness into a petty war between each other. They will continue to create sides for us to choose from. They will keep our minds focused on skin color and uniforms. They will tell us what opinion to have about events and other people. But what they will never do is bring focus back to the message of truth and change that is trying to be born and heard through this social upheaval. We've gone through a couple of different generations on, and you all spend, I'm sure, enormous amounts of money. But you know, first generation was kind of, you know, the hacker in the basement who just wanted to show he could do it, right? Or she could candidates. Do it. I mean um, the second was, well, big denial of service um, types of things where I'm going to stop you from doing whatever it is you want to do in your business or, or in the life. candidates. I mean Third generation was kind of, you know, I'm doing this for economic gain. I'm going to steal data and I'm going to sell it to people and I'm going to take your identity and I'm going to use it to my own financial uh, benefit. Manchurian My fear is that I mean, we're probably now getting to a point where we might have a fourth generation, which is what I would call 
data manipulation. They don't steal the data, they just change the data. So if you're a business and all of a sudden you don't know what your inventories are or where they are, or if you're a financial services firm and all of a sudden balances have been changed in accounts, but you know maybe the money didn't move, but you just don't know exactly where it is anymore. If you think about that kind of an attack. Manchurian candidates, I mean. Are we listening to it? Are we paying attention? Or are we falling into the trap of being divided and conquered once again? Because, I mean, the United States, you know, goes around the world. I come from Nicaragua, and I used to believe a lot in the United States. For me, this experience, as sad as it is, it's a big lesson in life, you know? You have two sides also to reconcile. You have a very dark side. I don't know the Soviet Union or the, or the worst Stalin period or, or the Nazi era, but I know the dark side of America, and it's pretty dark. Bitch! Get out! I'd like to see you without a fucking big dog! No guns in D.C. They, they should be protecting us. They, they're, you know, they got bosses. They gotta, you know, do what their boss says. I understand. But, you know, this is not the time for protecting your job. There's a so much bigger agenda and it, it's so much more than just the virus and keeping us safe no they want a global governance and no what do you think? this is time for doing the right thing sure thing uh, it should not make american proud i mean it, to reconcile that i mean so i know americans were working very hard you know i have read your books the church committee whatever trying to over, over, oversight control but what happened to those people there if you take an action where the cost to the individual is so minimal that he, in, in effect, won't miss it, uh, and someone else is benefited by it, fine. There's no argument against that whatsoever. It's very nice. There are a lot of things in, in human life are that way, like when you smile and say hello to somebody or good morning, how are you? Uh, it doesn't cost you anything. It expresses benevolence and respect for human life. But that has nothing to do with the question of people are dying right now in hospitals in many parts of the world, including the United States, where certain people could save them. Good propaganda, but it's uh, not very good uh, political science. Um, in the same way, those of us who take and hold to the socialist view um, in this century are perfectly well aware of the appalling crimes and failures, as well as of the defeats uh, that our movement is associated with. Um, my final submission, I think, would be um, that no one bothers to counterfeit a bad currency and that the claim of so many people who don't deserve it uh, to the socialist title uh, gives one hope for a, a, a more enlightened application of the idea in the non-capitalist future. Or something. So, you want me to cut out? Okay. Thank you. Response, please. It, it, not doing it will be catastrophic. It's nice, but we don't want just pandering. We want the streets to run red with rivers of blood. Although there's been talk of running popular no-values icon Branford Fisher as a third-party candidate, most are opposed to the idea. Many Americans have already pledged their support to a candidate. That's not the case with no-values voters, the political demographic who believe in a complete lack of morals and are committed to carrying out unspeakable acts of evil. 78 years old, 82 after four years. Twelve of our $17 trillion company investment firms have one or more representatives on either the G30 or the Trilateral Commission or both. If we took all his blood, we could save five other people's lives. He's got a rare blood type. Them giving a lot of their blood if he doesn't consent. Do you have the right to take one drop of his blood? Do you have the right to take all his blood? The level we're getting down to uh, is now metaphysical and epistemological, which is very good. It's a good sign. Uh, the language takes a holiday when you talk that way. And it's safe to say, as a finance, the financial executive committee of the transnational capitalist class. One organization, very small. The other one that's far more international is the Trilateral Commission. This was founded in 1973, and it brings together unofficially, without government oversight again, the highest level group possible to address important international problems.
In a recent poll of No Values voters, 54% said death is the issue they'd like presidential candidates to speak more about. Hey, news media, you have to ask the question, was Jeffrey Epstein attached to any intelligence service? And if you get shut down and said we don't discuss sources and methods, that's fine. But the fact that you won't ask the question about whether or not Jeffrey Epstein is attached to an intelligence service creates a vacuum. And that vacuum is going to be filled by believe fantastic things, the worst excesses of Alex Jones or QAnon or, or uh, the Nation of Islam or whatever. Right now, the problem is we have no adults. I'm pretending to be an adult on, on and that happened at the Capitol where certain people were just going to a, a rave, some people were going to a revolution, some people were just reporting it. Originally, the representatives were from Europe, US and Japan only. In later years, representatives from around the world, it started in 73 with Rockefeller funding. <clears throat> Currently, there are 375 members from 40 countries, 87 from the US, Germany has 20, France, Italy, UK have 18 each. The Asian group has 100 members, and the remaining 124 from countries all over the world. Each country has a quota and can nominate people as openings become available. Members take formal positions in their government they're asked to step down. So that you're, the formal members, if you're in government, you're not in, in the Trilateral Commission. Trilateral Commission is business executives, mostly men, but there's, there's a good portion of women there, um, who are setting policy privately. Um, they, they issue regular task force reports. The task force report in 2013, 14, was entitled Engaging Russia, a return to containment. Uh, generally speaking. The report expressed concern that the Russian invasion of Crimea, and invasions is in quotes there, because the Russians didn't really invade Crimea, they already had bases there. And that was an agreement with the Ukraine government for a long time. Putin was described as being, bringing about a ruthless break with the West. Under Putin, Russia was not contributing to global stability, but rather aspires to be a superpower. U.S. business leaders are concerned about the anemic growth and economic climate in Russia. Concerned with Putin and the topic of his removal were clearly uppermost in the minds of the trilaterals. Mm -hmm. The TCC business elites are salvating over the opportunities Russia's vast economic op resources offer for capital investment. Now under Yeltsin, when, when, the, when the wall fell and under Yeltsin, we did do a good bit of investment in Russia. We still have great investments there. But Putin has reasserted the government's control over the country. And so our capitalists are not as free to invest all over the world and it requires government approval. So they're, they're literally thinking and trying to put, a, you know, regime change in the U.S. and Russia as a primary agenda for what we're trying to do. That's why you've seen so much negative press in the U.S. corporate media about Putin and Russia. The tenor of the political debate right now seems focused on um, helping people and making positive change, and that's very alienating for people like us. Unless the candidates start talking about no-values issues, like molesting infants, torching the handicapped with flamethrowers, they're not going to win us over. While Barack Obama's website posted this photo of him kicking a child in the face at a campaign rally, and a statement from Obama pledging to do far worse if elected. Their primary goal is promotion of products and pro-capitalist propaganda. Propaganda through their psychological control of human desires, emotions, beliefs, fears, and values. That's what media does to us. Corporate media does this by manipulating our feelings and our cognition of human beings worldwide and promoting entertainment viewing as a distraction to global inequality. Don't be foolish. They're condemning themselves to death. Don't make a mistake. That will never happen. Oh, wait, it did. So Dwight Eisenhower said in 1953, every gun that's made, every warship launched, every rocket, rocket fire signifies in the final sense a theft from those who are hungry and are not fed, and those who are cold and not clothed. 
They'll begin by twisting the entire thing into some whacked out theory akin to, we got fluoride in our water and it's turning the frogs gay. Socialists in America made themselves felt by Wall Street with their militancy and uncompromising class consciousness. Fearing losing their power altogether, the empire's kingpins granted major concessions with the New Deal to try to quell the workers' rebellion. The movement at home wasn't the only thing scaring the elites. A rapidly changing world catapulted the repression. As a conspiracy theorist, I really suck because they seem to happen. This write-up from the New York Times was one of my favorites. Quote, a baseless conspiracy theory about the coronavirus has found new life as cases surge once again. Wow, it's baseless. Now, you'd expect to read the article and get a full rebuttal on the points that I laid out on my show. It took me an hour. You don't have 20 minutes. You could write something down and say, hey, this, he has this part wrong, this part wrong. No, in that article, not one time did the New York Times address any of our concerns. Not once. And it fell to me to work with a certain person in the organizing, organizing committee for the Olympic Games who had been assigned to work with the U.S. Embassy. And it was a radicalizing experience because I was learning more and more about the realities of the history of Latin America and where my work had played a role, a contemporary role in these uh, matters. And within a year after leaving the agency, I began to think the unthinkable. Those old pressures of disciplines of secrecy and, and uh, security consciousness had faded away, or beginning to fade, and I began to think about the possibility of a Bolshevik re revolution. Here you had poor people in the cities and in the countryside take the power, hold the power, and say that they're a socialist government. That inspired socialists all over the world. Socialists started in China and Vietnam and Korea, but also in America. And so the government came down heavy with the Pomerades to say, we're not going to tolerate uh, a, 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 a radical, general, a generalized radical resistance as evidenced by the Russian Revolution. So what happened in 1917 was the ruling class in America was panic stricken. By people with common class and financial interests. We think that the group of 30, the G30 it's called, is a private nonprofit group based in Washington. Uh, and that in fact, it was my sense that one had, and that by looking at this group, by looking at this superclass, if you will, we would be able to see how globalization might evolve because no group is more globalized and no group is having a greater influence on the nature of globalization than the most empowered people on the earth. Um, you know, the same thing is true in government as it is in business. The urgent will crowd out the important, mm -hmm. right? You know, so you've got to deal with the problems that you're facing right now. It's harder to think about that 20-year problem. Um, you know, I think for, uh, for CEOs, the focus is on we can see the skills we're going to need and trying to get those skills into your, your, your firm or your business. But you know, what about all those skills that you don't need anymore? That probably doesn't get as much focus. Um, what happens to those people? A lot of people who won't be retrained, can't be retrained, who will just want to cling to what they used to be doing. I think that's going to be a challenge for everybody. And there's a good audience among the conspiracy theorists. Uh, out there, and there are plenty of conspiracy theorists, and I, and I don't want to turn them away. And I thought, you know, it would be interesting to look to see whether such a, a, an elite has emerged for the global era. Extolling selfishness, but I think that, that such an understanding both slights human nature and tramples upon language. Well, I'm still uh, trying to figure out what the difference between us is. I, I think I keep coming back to this um, point about metaphysics versus uh, a, his, a historical view of human beings. What, what I'd call a kind of reification of capitalist man, where the traits that we associate with uh, early capitalism of uh, exchange, self-interested exchange, pursuit of profit, are understood in such a way as to encompass all of human nature itself, so that you get a kind of uh, uh, philosophy extolling selfishness. 
But I think that the ends justify the means. If the ends are rational, then the means will be rational to it. It's a rather vague question, which I think is what Mr. Hitchens was saying. Or love your brother as yourself, because you know what? He is yourself. We are literally all one. It's time for a new philosophy, folks. Your philosophy is hopelessly utopian. Um, I think I'll... And I think that, that what I find in the, uh, in the philosophy that um, uh, I've heard tonight is... Next question. Thank you. Um... Um, my friend, or if I can call you that, I uh, have much to offer uh, society today. It is hard for me to find even grounds for debate between you. All right. Um, I would like um, that the uh, that the the. Uh, Thanks. Both sides seem to address themselves to the rights and responsibilities of humans to each other, but there's very little said about the rights and responsibilities of humans to the environment they live in. Um, since your proposals, as far as I can see, um, would in effect uh, take us, uh, if they were successful, take us back to the early uh, uh, 19th century. And I just don't, simply don't think it's possible. I think that... Uh, uh, I, I think that your philosophy is hopelessly utopian. Are you here with your second question? What does socialism have to offer to those who are able to help themselves? And how do the quadriplegic and the weak hope to survive if the producers are throttled so that they can't produce? Wonderful. Next question, please. Uh, you've spoken on this subject, but I'm still not sure of your opinion. Uh, on the most basic level of this debate, it seems to me, has addressed the question, do the ends justify the means? In your opinion, do they? I don't find it possible to say no. I think there's more absurdity and more contradiction and less interest in the study of history <clears throat> revealed in someone who simply says no to that um, than there is to someone who says yes, but someone who says yes clearly invites about eight further questions, which you haven't asked. I, um, <clears throat> I don't mean to be either evasive or elusive. Next question, please. Thank you. But the point is that you are not a child, and the government should not treat you as a child. There is such a thing as reaching the age of reason. But under some forms of government, that age is never reached. Certainly, a parent owes the care to its child. And the child owes gratitude for that care if it's, if it's provided properly. Uh, so hopefully some of the propaganda and myths around these words and programs have been cleared up and you're able to look at them through a more objective lens. And the next time a politician proudly proclaims that they're a socialist and your grandpa automatically hates them, or you want to plan a vacation to the People's Republic of wherever, or someone says something smart, like communism works in theory, you'll know better. We regard capitalism as a system, not as an idea, and therefore as something that is a proper study of analysis of history and of economics, um, as well as of that of political competing ideology. Uh, that is, I think, that is the insight that the objectivists deny themselves and end up with um, the, I would have thought, superfluous injunction to humans to be self-interested, an injunction that does not seem, as one looks around, to be very much needed, uh, an idea that doesn't appear to require an enormous amount of reinforcement, though it might, as some think, require more justification than it's had uh, this evening. The problem is that we're taught as children, um, you know, uh, this, this ball earth lie. And, um, you know, you might ask as a child, you know, um, what about the people in Australia? You know, they're standing on the bottom of the globe, won't they fall off? And your teacher says, no, no, gravity. Capitalism as a system has coexisted with and in, on, on occasion sponsored uh, feudalism, monarchy, fascism, slavery, apartheid, and underdevelopment. Okay. BBC.
That's not what we said. I'm not going to even attempt to prove that they're just going to take over the world. That's not the plan. This story is about 10 rather close relations of ours who seem to get into almost exactly the same kind of trouble we do. All 10 of these jolly characters lived in the same neighborhood and were all good friends. <laughs> Good friends. Kissinger has previously argued for a joint effort between the U.S. and China on that issue, saying it would result in, quote, maximum pressure and workable guarantees while minimizing the risk of conflict between the two countries. Kissinger added the U.S. must take into account the concerns of South Korea and Japan. But if I could prove that influential leaders are working in concert with the World Economic Forum uh, and the UN, and many of your leaders are there and our leaders are there, and giant corporations are involved. You know, like Coca-Cola, I mean, massive amounts of money come from those investment management firms. They go into Coca-Cola or, or American Tobacco or, or the auto dealerships. I mean, yeah, multinational companies, they need to have money, they need to have people invested. Because it's really Wall Street that's, that's, that's setting those up and making those plans. We never said the World Economic Forum orchestrated the pandemic. Transnational corporations get a lot of invest, a lot of money from those sources. Read for yourself. The precariat is the working class people who are, are haven't aren't doing as well, and they're the ones that voted for Britex in in, in England. But that's not what we said. And um, so they're standing up and revolting. So now we're trying to figure out how do we deal with middle class people voting. God forbid. Or have you done that and you know? It's not you and me investing in them unless you're in a pension plan that does a little bit of that. Which is theirs. I showed you their academic papers that they've already begun to publish. Everything is there in black and white. It would be a conspiracy if, if that's what we were saying, but this is no conspiracy because they're not really hiding it. It's out fully open in the public.